talk more about economists. <laughs> Can you stop that after his after his presentation? Yes, I stop it. Yes, I where's, where's my where's my where's my, uh, where's my pointer? It's up in the court, in the podium there. Behind the computer. Behind the computer. Okay. Well, we're in for a real treat now. <laughs> Last year, I introduced Joe as the third greatest uh, monetary reformer in the US. And he, he said, no, 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 there's Dick Distelhorst. And I wasn't, I wasn't forgetting Dick, but I was, and what I meant to say is, Matt and you know, now with Stephen and Bob and Dick have passed away, but um, Stephen always, and Bob always rated Joe as, um, as the leading um, thinker and, 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 and um, student and studier of the monetary system. And um, he's, he had a bit of a head start because his father was um, taught, raised in it. So um, now Joe has um, been studying this for a long time. And we, we first, um, Steve and I first came across Joe, we found a video of Joe talking about the American Monetary Act as it was then. And he was talking about Milton Friedman and, and Irving Fisher and all that. And we thought, wow, wow, this guy is amazing. We've got to reach him. And so we, we found out how to reach him. And, and then Joe came to the conference that year and things just blossomed from there. So uh, and then Joe has discovered a lot of uh, interesting stuff about the, the program for monetary reform from the period of the Chicago plan and then what happened after that with the uh, thinking of Hyman Minsky. And, um, and it's, it's very interesting. Uh, and he's spoken about that in previous conferences, but this year he's going to really be concentrating on this 1939 program in 1984 because that was something that was put together by economists. They were academic economists. They, they at that time, did seem to not be under such pressure as they are now. And um, so there was uh, good results that came out of that. So please give a very warm welcome to Joe Bongiovanni. Thank you all. I hope, I hope I'm going to remember to keep the mic here so that you can hear me. Um, and, um, and I may be stepping out here just because I'm going to probably be reading over my shoulders. But um, I just want to make a couple of observations you know, sort of, sort of tying in this theme from Nick's presentation um, and and our discussion of you know where where are the economists when we need them? Um, because uh, you know I had no idea that it would work that way. Uh, but uh, I want to encourage everybody who hasn't read Lucille Eckrich's book. Okay, I, I haven't read it, but why would so why would I do that? Because I stopped at Lucille's house when I was on my way out last. And had an evening with her in which he pointed out some of the uh, some of the uh, really important and critical to this question uh, 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 record that she has put together in her book, and uh, which confirms uh, what Mary you know what Mary observed here just a minute ago, which is that which is that there has been a very specific and a very detailed and a very recorded history of a, uh, I want to call it a narrowing uh, by the study of economics of, of, uh, of what's, you know, what's generally good in terms of socioeconomics, uh, what's needed in terms of the study of socioeconomics. And we moved away uh, systematically from what was the study of political economy. And political economy was pretty much everything, you know, pretty much, it was pretty much everything that's going on with, with our politics that involves economics. And we moved into two other fields, which, 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 which are political science, you know, make, making, uh, making, making, making politics the science. And, and in terms of economics, what, I guess what, what I would call, um, you know, this, the study of 
kind of like the study of trends and the study of the study of, uh, of data and the modeling and, and 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 all of that kind of stuff, which is the modern the modern science of of, econ of economics. So so I'm just saying that that I think that to me it was it, when when we after dinner you know when we when we were sitting around talking and she she took out a book and she pointed to me how she has in fact. Um, identified causally what happened within the academic uh, uh, curriculum or committees uh, to, to actually winnow down our understanding of, of monetary economics. And so we have this outcome. Um, I think that you all know that, you know, my dad told me that 90% of economists don't know where money comes from. And, and I think that, you know, that's a generous observation, you know. But, 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 but in fact, but in fact, you know, I talked last year about, you know, ignorance is the biggest stumbling block that we have in, in terms of trying to reform money. It's, it's ignorance. It's the fact that people don't know how money works or where money comes from or how any of that stuff works. Um, so the 1939 program for monetary reform. So my dad, my dad had a copy, if it's okay. My dad had a copy and he made me read it. And it was a hard read. It was a hard read, not, 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 not because of the content, but because of the form, it basically was like printed on mimeograph paper that uh, that had light light parts and dark parts and, and 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 so it was a struggle really to get to get through it. But my dad, when my dad gave it to me, he said, "This is actually the best document that has been created thus far um, uh, by the uh, by the economic community, by the economist community, with regard to money, because because of the." Because of the uh, uh, the people that were involved in it, they were all they were all progressive political economists. That is to say, even though their study was in political economy, they were into political economics. You had to be, and it was it was kind of like uh, you know this is kind of like the old school. I'm just going to put it that way. This is the old school of economics and political economy, and um, and so and so. Uh, my dad had a copy, and when my dad passed, when my dad passed away, I, I thought I was going to get a bunch of his papers that it turns out I, I wasn't able to get. And this was one of the things that I, I was really wanting to get a hold of, and have a hold of. And it wasn't until I came to this conference in 2008 or 9, and I was with Pete Young, my partner then, who was, who was doing the Coffee with Joe stuff with, with and uh, Jamie, uh, Jamie and, and, and Stephen and Dick and, uh, and Bob, they had everything out there on the page. And I, we took a break and Steve, Pete and I walked around, Pete and I walked around, and I looked down there and there it was, the 1939 program for Monterey. Now I don't want to tell you what Stephen was, wanted, wanted us to pay for it, because it was a lot to me, you know. But it was, the copy was there, you know, that was the record, it was there. And Pete and I were walking around, and, uh, and Pete heard me go, oh, wow, there it is. And he turned around, and he said, what? And I said, this is, this is the document. This, this is the document. Now, the Chicago plan went further in certain respects, actually, than the 1939 program did. But in terms of the detail about how the money system actually works and how we have to make changes in the money system, the 1939 program document was, 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 was way far superior. So. So I took that home, and um, uh, you know, don't tell anybody, Jamie. But you know, we made a couple copies of it because I was in I was in Virginia and P was in Vermont. We had to discuss it, you know, uh, by Skype. So so we printed a couple of copies, and he had it, and we had them, and we actually did several videos. I don't remember how many exactly, maybe three or four or five or something like that, about the program for monetary reform, um, and, and discussing its its main its main its main. Uh, points. Um, and then, this is what I have to do today, okay? And then, one of the people who subscribed to our Coffee with Joe at economicstability.org, you know, um, website and blog, was a fellow from Michigan. Dang it. <laughs> uh, he, 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 he carried on online under the name Zarathustra, okay? And uh, and his name was Nick. Dang it, I forget his name, but I'm going to get it to you, to you later. But 
But anyway, Nick was like, hey, we got to get that document. We got to make that document into something that you know people can. And I said, well, I, I, I don't know how to do it. Pete said, I don't know how to do it. So we made a copy. We sent it to him. We, we sent it to him, and he did it. Okay, he typed it up. He typed it up into a Word document so that we could have it. So that we could all have it, and we all can have it today. There's a link on the website that Jamie has to it. Which has been embellished again uh, by by our friend in the uh, in the Green Party, um, who on the Green Party Banking and Monetary Reform Committee, who's again just a little bit better. But but if it wasn't for the if it wasn't for that work originally done, there would be no electronic version of the 1939 program for monetary reform. And right now today, if you go right over here to Bo to the University of Chicago to the Booth Library. Uh, you will find in the, uh, in the uh, uh, faculty library of the Booth Business School a copy of the 1939 program for monetary reform linked there, okay? But none of this stuff would be happening if it wasn't for the work that, you know, this one person who, who is a, he's a monetary reformer and, and, he, and, he's a, and, he, and, he, and he and he actually did it. It took him several weeks of, you know, constant, constant stuff. And then, of course, once we got it from him, we had to run it up against the original, you know, to make sure that. And so, um, let's see. And so, that's what I'm going to talk about, about, about the 1939 Program for Monetary Reform, its authors, and its work. And what's in there, and what's different. What's the contrast between some of the stuff that Nick talk, just talked about. I mean, how come economists back then cared enough about outcomes to put their put their positions on the line. Um, the real the real story about this about this paper is that it was circulated widely as to the widest possible group of, of, of academic economists and asked them for their position. And I'm going to go through that in, in some detail. Okay, so, so, um, oh, so it's going to work like that, is it? Okay. Um, that might be the best of it. So, so, uh, where are the kinds of, a program for monetary form. This is the contents of the monetary form, and I'm going to, I'm going to discuss somewhat everything that I've got highlighted. But what you can see, what you can see is a, it's a systemic, uh, review of how the monetary system works. Everything that is going on with regard to the monetary system and how it actually works and how it needs to change and work is covered here in this document. Uh, you know, according to that, according to that, um, uh, according to that table of contents. Okay, now it seems like it seems like I have somehow. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. I somehow, I'm not good at this. But okay, so I want to I want to say I want to say this. These are, the, these are the authors, you know, Paul Douglas, and anybody here from Chicago, you know, Paul Douglas is like, is like one of the most famous of the uh, political economists ever, you know, uh, in the history of the city, uh, who went on to become a United States Senator from Illinois for many, many years, and was one of the most progressive, liberal and liberal progressive uh, um, political economists in the Congress for a generation, really. So he was he was in a, he was a, a, a tremendous uh, uh, influencer and 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 bearer of truth to the things that are going on in, in the political economy. And Irving Fisher, most people know who he is. You know, he's the author of uh, the 100% Money Book and you know the um, the, the uh, theory of depression, the, the the debt deflation theory of great depressions. Um, so he's a, he was another guy. And you know, they 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 were granted their degrees in political economy. That's what I want to say. Now there used to be a program of degrees, a degree in political economics that we don't have today, or if we do have it today, it has to be in a very very highly specialized uh, school about about here and there. And Frank Graham from Princeton was another of the leading, really truly leading economists of of that time. So to me, those three guys were the real heavyweights 
And not to say anything about Earl Appleton, Wilfred King, or Charles Whittlesey, because they were all remarkably renowned in their in their fields. Now they were not all economists. In fact, um, I think Whittlesey was I'm pretty sure was a statistician. So on the cover page of, of what, what became what we what we printed and put out, we put on the note: this document has reformatted been reformatted by the Kettle Pond Institute without permission of the original authors to whom we owe the utmost gratitude and admiration for this timeless piece of work. That was our observation in, well, I would say maybe 2010, you know, after I picked that up here in 2009 and it took, you know, a, a, a period of time. And then the further note, copied to HDLM format with the table of contents by Kevin McCormick from the Green Party of Texas, who is an associate of ours on the banking and monetary reform of the Green Party of the United States of which we have actually the committee chairs right here in this room today, I'm so glad to say, thank you very much. Uh, so, and, and which I'm very, very happy to be working, uh, you know, over, over this time. So, okay, said, said way too much already, and I wish I had the, does this, does this work? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let me see if I can do this. Press the button in the uh, middle and you get the little dot, and press the buttons on the side to make it go frontwards or backwards. Okay, great. Okay, so here I went. Here, I'm sorry. So here, I, I've, I've gone through this. That, that's that's it. Now I want to talk. I'm going to talk probably more than you would imagine about two sort of only explanatory, you know, uh, uh, aspects of the thing. One is the foreword, and the other is the introduction, because it is in the foreword that these economists take on the issue of what it is that they're trying to do and present it. And and, uh, and and if you look at, this, at these at these uh, the, you know these observations, the great task confronting us today is that of making our American system, which we call democracy, work. No one can doubt that it's threatened. However, the danger lies less in the propaganda of autocratic governments from abroad. Remember, in the 1930s, that's what everybody was thinking about. You know, the autocratic governments from abroad. <clears throat> than in the existence here in America of 10 million of unemployed workers, sharecroppers living barely at subsistence level, and hundreds of thousands of idle machines. On such a soil, fascist and communist propaganda can thrive. Without full employment, such propaganda would be futile. I'm sorry, with full employment, such propaganda would be futile. The important objective, therefore, is to repair and rebuild our economic system so that it will again employ our productive resources to the full most practical extent. A high scale of living for our people will better protect our cherished American democracy than in all the speeches and writing in the world. Amen. Amen. Our problems are not simple, and we can offer no panacea to solve them. We believe, however, that certain fundamental adjustments in our economy are essential to any successful attempt to bring our idle men, materials, land, and machines together. They did mention land. Yes. These fundamental adjustments could, we believe, be facilitated by the monetary reform here proposed. So there it is. I mean, I, I mean, like, to me, it's like uh, that is such a magnanimous statement. You know, we are we are going to undertake to do what needs to be done to understand how to bring our economy back to, back together so that the idle resources will become productive. Throughout our history, no economic problem has been more passionately discussed than the money problem. Probably none has had the distinction of suffering so much from general misunderstanding. What we're talking about, what we've been talking about. Suffering from more heat than light. As a result, not only is our monetary system now wholly inadequate and in fact unable to fulfill its function, but the few reforms which have been adopted during the past three decades have been patchwork, leaving the basic structure still unsound. That's a pretty bold statement. You know, to be to be made by you know by by this group. And analyzing this problem, we conclude that it is preeminently the responsibility of American economists. It is preeminently the responsibility of American economists to present constructive proposals for a solution. But before organizing a movement for monetary reform, we wish to determine how many of our cohorts and associates might agree with us. For this purpose, we drew up a program for monetary reform, which we believe comprised the essential features of what needs to be done in order to put our monetary system into working condition 
and we sent this to the completest available list of academic economists. Up to the date of this writing, July 1939, 235 economists from 157 universities and colleges have expressed their general approval of this program. 40 more have approved it with reservations, 43 have expressed disapproval. The remainder have not yet replied. Well, if you do the math right there, that's about an 85% approval rating among all economists. And to me, that is absolutely remarkable. What it proves is that in 1939, the economists were not the economists that we're talking about today, okay? They were, they were in fact, real economists, economists who, who uh, you know, had, had what was going on uh, um, in the street, you know, and, and in the land uh, to, in their heart. We want the American people to know where we stand in this important matter. The following was first draft of an exposition of our program and the part it may play in, in reconstructing America, so, you, know, you know, signed, signed by the gentleman. So that's the foreword. That's the foreword of, of, of the program. What you can see there is, is you know, life, liberty, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is very much on the front of their, front of their thinking. And then there, and then they go on in the, in, in, in the introduction, I'm, 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 I'm gonna spend, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, more time on the foreword and introduction, you know, parts than actually the mechanical parts, because it's the attitude, you know, of doing what needs to be done, you know, that these guys brought to the table and carry the carry forward with it. So, so uh, this, uh, there's one of my favorite lines right there, which is, the, which is the second one. The following suggested monetary program is put forth not as a panacea or even a full solution to the depression problem. It is intended to eliminate one recognized cause of great depressions and then the second to the point. The lawless variability in our supply of circulating medium. Keyword. Lawless. Keyword, lawless. The bankers can do whatever they want. And because the bankers can do whatever they want, and each time, each time you see that go like that, the bankers win. No matter which way it's moving. No well-informed person would pretend that our present monetary and banking machinery is perfect, that it operates as it should to promote an adequate and continuous exchange of goods and services, that it enables our productive resources, our labor materials and capital, to be fully or even approximately employed. Indeed, the contrary is the fact that the purpose of money and credit were to discourage the exchange of goods and services, to destroy periodically the wealth produced, to frustrate and trip those who work and save, our present monetary system would seem the most effective instrument to that end. Now that is a hell of a statement. I mean, that is a hell of a statement. And I'm gonna point something out, that this is a historic document, but so many of the references that it makes are still true today. Still true today. I'm not going to. I'm not going to read through this. Um, and, and one thing I want to point out again is that Jamie, in describing my talk today, put a link to the to the um, uh, to the paper that that Howard that uh, uh, Kevin uh, uh, put together as a as an HTML document, which is really you know magnanimous. The monetary reforms you propose are intended primarily to prevent these ups and downs in the volume of our means of payment. Remember, the lawless variability in the supply of our circulating medium. Prevent these ups and downs in the volume of our means of payment with their harmful influences on business. No claim is made, however, that this will entirely do away with business cycles. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say later on, they make some very, I would say, very bold uh, observations in that regard. Something that we, I feel, need to keep in mind, which has to do with the fact that monetary reform doesn't fix everything. It just makes everything possible to fix. So, 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 if you, if you read the table of contents, the first thing they talked about was the gold standard. What was the problem with the gold standard? How the gold standard 
threatened, you know, the well-being of the of the country and the people because of the fact that it was an arbitrary, you know, commodity that that had no reality to the things that make up economics or the economy. So, so coming from that, we say, but now we say that central banks no longer operate according to the rules of the gold standard. How do they determine their monetary policies? What standard has replaced the gold standard? And this is where, you know, again, if you're reading, uh, if you were reading Paul um, Douglas's or, or Irving Fisher's writings of the day, you know, the standard of stable buying power, uh, uh, you know, that was kind of like what the FDR uh, declared in terms of his uh, trying to take over uh, the monetary system from the bankers in, in, in uh, you know, after the crash in 1933. Um, you know, he said something like, you know, the dollar would always be worth the dollar, or something like that. And, and really, that's all it's all about. In terms of running the monetary system, there's two things. There's, there's, there's the value of it, which has to be kept st stable, permanently stable, as, as close as possible. And there's the volume of it, which has to be, be matching the productive capacity of the economy. Those are kind of like to be the two things. <coughs> So, so, so they make the observation here that coming out of the 20s and, and, and into the 30s that it was really the Scandinavian countries that moved quickly to repair their economies through monetary reform, through, through, through the use of the money system, I'll put it that way, not, not so much monetary reforms, but reforms that in fact enabled them to keep going. And part of it was parity economics, just in case anybody wants to know. Um, <coughs> So, so, so what, what are we saying? In terms of the nation's monetary policy, the needs of its domestic economy have taken the place of the arbitrary rules of the gold standard. After the experience of the past decade, it's improbable that many countries will want to give their currencies arbitrary gold values at the cost of domestic inflation and depression. You've got to realize it's 1939. You know, it's 1939. Uh, FDR had just in 33, you know, taken, uh, taken, uh, gold off the table as being our arbiter of, of, of economic value. And, and it, don't think for a minute that it was an immediate, strong pushback against that, that, uh, that change to, to our policy. So, so these guys were just you know, speaking up for it. <clears throat> yada yada. And for the United States, stability in the domestic purchasing power of the dollar is certainly of far more importance than stability in its exchange value in terms of Foreign monetary unit, and this is a, this to me is is a great a great statement about about the importance that we pay attention to the internal e economy of the country and deal with foreign and deal with um, you know outside influences and I'm going to say you know foreign exchange markets, however you want to think of it. As, as being the total secondary thing. What's important is that, is that you know, I hire you, you hire me, we do stuff, and everything stays, everything stays nicely valued together over time. <clears throat> so, so as they move from that, that uh, stability of the buying power of the dollar, okay, they talk about how they're going to accomplish it. But now, now, now we've got, a, now we've got, and it's the same one we have now. And by the way. By the way, I, I, I really should back up and say this, okay? As good as it is, as good as this is, it ain't half as good as the Need Act, okay? I just want to say that. As great as it is, it ain't half as good as the Need Act because the Need Act covers all the stuff that it, this does not cover, and it does it in a way that's also holistic with regard to how, how, you know, how, how the entire economy works. So they, so they propose, they, they propose consideration two standards, how to get, how to keep the money going, and one way was a per capita standard, and one way was the cost of living standard. So, so those are those are kind of the two standards. Um, under the constant cost of living standard, the monetary authority would, however, have to observe closely the movement of other more sensitive indices with a view to preventing development of dis disequilibrium as between sensitive and insensitive prices. And I'm going to tell you that this is another reference to parity economics. <clears throat> so, 
So under the former of the, of the two arrangements, the monetary authority would have to ascertain the amount of circulating medium and active circulation and whatever amount of circulating medium seemed necessary to keep unchanged the amount of money per head of population. Well, well, when I read that, when I first read that, and I talked to my dad about it, I said, that seems simplistic. You know, it just kind of seems simplistic. Um, we're not going to give the money, you know, to each person. You know, so what difference does it make, um, you know, if there's a relationship between them? Uh, well, that was, again, just to get to the volume of the means. And then the constant cost of living standard, the market basket standard, and 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 this is this is pretty much how we you know how we consider and value inflation. Okay, we, we, we do it really sort of, sort of through a basket of, of, of economic goods. Um, and as a matter of fact, I, I, this is a really an important thing with regard to that. So in other words, today we still do it, right? Today we still do it, and yet I know. Sorry, Jim. Yes, today we still do it, and yet. The retail prices involved in the cost of living index, being relatively sticky, do not afford the information necessary for regulating the volume of money. The monetary authority might therefore find it desirable to include in the standard some commodities having, having sensitive prices. And again, this goes back to parity economics. In order to make its action respond more quickly to the direction in which things are moving. So in other words, what they're saying is that, is that money and everything and this realization to me that money ain't everything is a big part of our understanding of how the economy really works. Our need, I'm going to say, to understand how the, about how the economy really works. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to read the highlight. Therefore, the monetary authority should study the movements of all available indicators of economic activity and prosperity with a view to determine just what collection of prices, if stabilized, would lead to the highest degree of stability in production and employment. Production and employment, those are like their, that's how they view the two sides of the economy. They don't use, they don't look at it as, as, as production and consumption, they look at it production, you know, and employment, because people need income. Now, some say employment means wages, but we need income, that's what we need. And so they're saying in order to have the highest degree of stability in production and income, uh, we need to study everything that's going on out there. And I'm just going to promise you that, again, that they are thinking about parity economics. Now, this is a quintessential collective observation from me, OK? <laughs> I, I, and I'm only saying that that's my label that I put on it, OK? I, I didn't write any of this. This is in the program, the 1939 program. It says, essentially, however, the purposes of any monetary standard is to standardize the unit of value, just as a bushel standardizes the quantity and a noun standardizes the unit of weight. To furnish a dependable standard should therefore be the only requirement of monetary policy. It would be fatal if the public were led to believe that the monetary authority, solely through monetary manipulations, were able to assure, to assure the maintenance of prosperity and should therefore be made responsible for it. Now, to me, this is this is another key observation. We, we need to know more about political economy. We need to know more about economy. And having the right amount of money, we always keep, we always say, you know, well, we need to have the right amount of money in order to have the right amount of production, and the right amount of income. Yeah. But that ain't everything. You know, that ain't everything. And if we don't understand that ain't everything, we're going to miss a lot. And for those of us studying parity economics, we know we're going to miss some key factors of how the economy really works. Any such assumption would probably mean the demise of the monetary authority in the first period of adversity. So we got to be clear about that. I mean, I feel we, we really do have to be clear about understanding that fact. Uh, our monetary system is thus permeated with discretionary powers. Now, this is, this goes to the Fed. Okay, this, this goes to the Fed. You know, but there is no unity about it. No control, and worst of all, no prescribed policy. In a word, there is no mandate based on any definite principle. So, again, they're going to get into it now because the criteria of a monetary policy, and I promise you, that was in the Need Act is superior even to what they, you know, to the conclusions that they come to, because the Need Act is a terrific, terrific document. Um, I'm not going to.
going to read, I'm not going to read all of this, but it goes down. To, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I got to point this out. I got to point this out. We should set up, we should set up certain definitive, definite criteria according to which our march of should be carried out. Up to the present time, up to the present time, 1939, 2019, 80 years later, they're saying up to the present time, and I'm saying up to the present time. Okay, that's the only difference. That's the only difference. Up to the present time, Congress has merely given our monetary agencies certain broad powers with no explicit directions as to how these powers should be used. Today, we have no clear and definite standard by which to measure success or failure, and consequently, there is no way by which we can tell clearly and definitely whether the diverse agencies are giving us the best service they can. So what's the sense in calling the Federal Reserve before the Congress? The Federal Reserve, going before the Congress, is a litany of excuses. And gobbledygook, as far as I'm concerned, was about headwinds and, you know, that kind of crap. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> but that's, you know, I'm just, what I'm saying is that, is that we've never had, we've never had the, the monetary, the uh, structure of a monetary system where a coherent policy can be identified, put into place, followed, and, and manifest itself in terms of the well-being of the country. So, so they go back to and say, our most powerful monetary agency, the Board of Governors, proceeds on the basis of a broad statement of general principles, which it published in September 1937. So that was only two years ago then. <laughs> you know, now it's 82 <laughs> years ago, but it's still the same statement. This is not the law, but merely an expression of opinion on the part of the members of the Board as to what they, at that particular time, thought they ought to do. There is no compulsion about it. It is not binding on the board itself. Now think about that. Think about that. Anybody wants to talk about the monetary authority? No, it's a public, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a public, you know, public, public policy. The Federal Reserve carries it out. The board believes that economic stability rather than price stability should be the general objective of public policy. As if, they're, as if they are, you know, contravening, uh, you know, uh, you know, efforts and directions. It is convinced that this objective cannot be achieved by monetary policy alone, but that the goal should be sought through coordination of monetary and other major policies of the government, which influence business activity, including particularly policies with respect to taxation expenditures, lending, foreign trade, agriculture, and labor. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like let's pronounce everything is, is everything, and 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 see 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 how that helps. It should be declared objective of the government to be the declared objective of the government of the United States to maintain economic stability, and should be the recognized duty of the board of governors of the Federal Reserve System to use all its powers to contribute to a concerted effort by all agencies of the government toward the attainment of this objective. In a general way, however, the board's declaration conformed to the general principles of monetary stability enunciated by President Roosevelt in 33, and that's back to what I was saying earlier. President was more specific than the board mentioned the objective, mentioning the objective of stable buying power of the dollar. <clears throat> After that, it says, that is, this is their observation, the board is now free to reserve itself, reserve to itself the widest possible discretion in the use of its powers under any circumstances that may arise. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the problem. That is the problem of why our monetary system and our, our monetary system is run amok and our economy is, is run as a, a tearing between the needs of the people and that group of elites that, that Nick was telling us about earlier. <clears throat> and so, so they go on to say, well, how does the public know of the real aims of the board? Again, these are economists, you know, that are speaking out about about the uh, about the board. Once Congress determines the criteria of monetary policy, many current erroneous beliefs in erratic varieties of managed currency as a cure-all for our economic ills may be replaced by more rational views as to the many important things that need to be done outside the monetary field in order to put our economic system into working condition. Our less disturbing monetary factors have first been largely eliminated. The relative importance of other necessary measures cannot be determined. I mean, 
that to me is a pretty salient, you know, statement. You know, we 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 really don't we really don't have the goods on figuring out what's wrong with the system because why? Because at about that time, political economy went down the drain. Okay, because of what happened in 1939. Remember, this was this was supposed to be the first iteration of this program. Okay. Then the war came along, the wartime economics, and 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 nobody nobody was really involved in the study any, any anymore after that. Quite frankly, by the time the end of the war came around, six years later, you know these guys were writing other books about other things individually, and there was no there was not a collective effort of of uh, of trying to gather around economic things. Criteria for monetary management adopted should be so clearly defined and safeguarded by law as to eliminate the need of permitting any wide discretion to our monetary authority. And um, and I, I just want to make an observation, a personal observation here about this, because sometimes monetary reformers think they're smarter than you know. Uh, I'm going to say the building blocks from from history uh, that brought us to the Need Act. Okay, we hear criticisms of the monetary. Well, I think that monetary authority structure, you know, is not is not right. It's not a good idea. Well, the monetary authority, the monetary authority can can either be only a name, okay, and it has been throughout history when there are central banks of the monetary authorities, okay, um, and they're private. Um, but here, what these guys are saying is that we need to have a monetary authority whose work is clearly defined in law so that they have no option except to present us with a money system that works. And, 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 and in, in terms of developing the criteria that they're going to work by, and, and et cetera. In order for our monetary policy to make to conform to this new standard and become the means of attaining a high degree of prosperity and stability, legislation should be enacted embodying the following features. Now, if you find any features in here that are not in the Need Act, that's their fault, okay? Because they didn't foresee what the, you know what the, what the Need Act was going to do. But but the first thing is definitely there: the monetary authority would become the agent of Congress in carrying out the function set forth in the Constitution to coin money and regulate the value thereof. Article One, Section Eight. There are some people who say that that's a, not the germane, uh, you know. Uh, population in the Constitution, but of course it is. <clears throat> I'm not gonna I'm not I'm not gonna read through that. Um, Congress should give the monetary authority a mandate. Now this is this is again, I want you to test what they're saying against what's in the Need Act. Because the Need Act, you know, comes out to measure right up to what what they're what they're saying. To maintain that those powers were specific, specifying the monetary standard to maintain, which the powers would be exercised, the mandate should also define the part which monetary policy would play in attaining the objectives of steadily increasing prosperity. prosperity. Not only would such a mandate cause the monetary authority to use its powers for the purpose of attaining the standards set by Congress, but it would also prevent the abuse of these powers. The monetary authority would then have a definite standard to attain. Well, I'm going to go through these, and I'm just going to read a couple of little parts of it. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry, uh, another editorial comment here. <laughs> what they wrote was, the monetary authority might be the Federal Reserve Board. Uh-huh, uh-huh, that's my part. <laughs> uh, 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 they're, they're all private people, you know, working for private interests. Um, I don't know. Well, anyway. But, but, or another body associated there with associated there with, I'm just going to say, there with monetary uh, policy. Step <coughs> three from political influence. The standard and the means maintaining it should be so narrowly defined by Congress as to leave only a minimum of discretion to the monetary authority. The members should be selected solely on the basis of their fitness for the job and should be subject to removal by Congress for acting in opposition to the mandate laid down by it. So but my, my main point is, in 1939, these guys were saying, we need a monetary authority, and we need to make sure that it's in place by law. 
you know, to correct that uh, that uh, lawless variation in the volume of our circulating medium, and that it's empowered to ensure that prosperity for all be the be the uh, uh, you know be the objective. Neither the president nor the treasury has any other agency of the government should have power to alter the volume of circulating medium. So basically, yeah, we're saying that we're recognizing this is uh, the, 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 their. Their take on it was almost more like the the, the fourth the fourth branch of government than than anything that you know that we've talked about and anywhere that I've talked about it because because they were saying they had to be independent you know and they said they, they said they were really going to serve the Congress no matter what because, because it's the Congress's mandate so anything about the discretionary powers and etc all are all gone. <clears throat> Once Congress has established a monetary authority and given it a mandate, no other agency should then have any concurrent or conflicting powers. Uh, that's again, that's, that's again kind of like what, I, what I mean about that. Okay, this is a kind of an interesting, there's less danger in giving to a monetary authority of the type described above any or all of the powers necessary to control a monetary system than there is in the present system under which wide discretionary powers are assigned to several agencies with more or less conflicting interests and with inadequate instructions to any of them concerning the use of them. That's the call for reform to me. That's the call for reform. The situation that we have now doesn't work, plain, plain and simple. <clears throat> Get into the government creation of money. <clears throat> Under 100% requirement, monetary authority would replace the banks as the manufacturer of our circulating medium. As long as our population and trade continue to increase, there will in general be a need for increasing the volume of money in circulation. The monetary authority might satisfy this need by purchasing and retirement government bonds with new money. Now see, that's the old fashioned thing. Because, because these guys were not into United States money so much as in fixing the monetary system that we have. They were about repairing the monetary system that we have. There is no call for ending the Fed. Okay? There is no call. There's a call for ending fractional reserve banking flat out, but there's no call for ending the Fed. Now, to me, I could be wrong about this, but my observation is these guys are economists. They're going to they're going to query academic economists. Academic economists like to keep working. So they have been in the process of eradicating political economy and at the same time trying to repair the, uh, 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 the system that, that, you know, that we have. Um, so the idea of the using purchasing and retirement government bonds with new money. Uh, that to me is, it, it, it is inconsequential. <clears throat> we talk about the benefits to both the government and the banks, and, and then it says under the 100% reserve system, such purchases of bond by the monetary authority would directly and correspondingly increase the volume of circulating medium. That would be how they would do it. That would be the purpose of doing it, how they do it. Conversely, the sale of the bonds by the Federal Reserve would direct and correspond to reduce the money. So in other words, they're just giving it to you there that under a full reserve system, we have a mechanism for increasing and de decreasing the volume of money uh, uh, as required in order to maintain the stability of the purchasing power of the dollar. Um, <clears throat> well, this goes back to what next Point, point earlier because there is a sort of a co a co benefit. The assumption by the monetary authority that money creating responsibility would incidentally ben benefit the government by reducing the interest bearing public debt prior to pass with every dollar of new currency put out. It would benefit the public and the banks by preventing panics and resulting failures. And it would benefit the public because of the greater stability of prices, employment, and profits. In early times, the creation of money was the sole privilege of the kings and other sovereigns, namely the sovereign people acting through their government. This principle is firmly anchored in our Constitution, and it is a perversion to transfer the privilege to private parties 
to use in their own real or presumed interest. That's a pretty strong statement. You know, that, to me, that's a very strong statement. It's a perversion of the historic um, experience of how money was, was created for, as Stephen said, for thousands of years, um, for, for rather than for the good of the realm, whatever that was, instead to the, to the good of the private people, the gold orders and whomever. <clears throat> Fractional reserve system. Well, I only put this up there actually to get the headline. A chief loose screw in our present American money and banking system. A chief loose screw in our present <coughs> money and banking system is the requirement of only fractional reserves behind demand deposits. So then they talk about it, and again, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go into very much of this very much of this stuff because what where they're going is where they're going is to full reserve banking. So, I just, I just got confused. Was, was, was that their words or your words? No, those are their words. Really? No, those are their words. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, like I said, you know, uh, Jamie put the link there. That sounds like Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and they talk about the reserves and how really there are no reserves, you know. They talk about that. They go right in there and they say, you know, and this, and this money event is about Federal Reserve Bank, they're not reserves. Everything is just a promise. Everything is, 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 is a, 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 a string. Okay, so so uh, again, I'm not I'm not going to go through this, but but there's a, a lot there um, in, in terms of really in terms of really good stuff. The hundred percent reserve system. And you got to realize, I mean, I mean, uh, you know. Um, All of the all of the economists, um, especially the monetary economists of that era, uh, thinking up to full reserve banking. That is to say, you know, to end the the uh, lawless variability in the supply of our circulating medium again. Um, uh, that's as far as they could think. You know, they they couldn't think like Stephen Zolanyi did about how to make greenbacks. You know, into money. You know, uh, as our money. Um, they just couldn't do it. They and I and I say and I and I'm dead serious about this because they wanted to keep working. You know, they didn't want to be the threat that we end up being because we want to change the whole system because our socioeconomic justice demands it. So we're back to them. We're back to where, we're back to where they are. So I'm going to uh, I'm just I'm just going to. Uh, There's, there's, there's a lot here. I wanted to get to the point. Oh, that, that was it. Sorry. <clears throat> this is this is the 18th point out of I think 18 points that they made in this in this in this study. Um, it's that the 100 percent reserve system may be may be inevitable. Well, they're right. It may have been inevitable in 1939. And if you read why. Why they say it was inevitable in 1939, that's the reason why monetary reform is inevitable today for us. We're not going to full reserve banking, we're going to real money, and we're going to do it on the basis of all of the you know, principles, all of the very important protections, all of the very real uh, workings that these guys put forward but they didn't get to the, they were not able to, they could not get to the point of calling for an end to the Fed and a government, a complete government takeover of issuing the money uh, and, and spending it into existence, you know, and, and et cetera, et cetera. They, 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 they couldn't go that far. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna come to, a, to what, I'm, what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna suggest, honestly, is that Y'all open up that uh, link that Jamie has and get to the part where it says the 100% reserve system may be inevitable. Because what you'll see is that, is, that, is that they have it there. The other system's not working. You know, the system we have is not working. And again, 80 years ago, they said the system's not working. And it can't be made to work 
and we need to reform things in order to have prosperity, liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and liberty and justice for all. We can't have that with the money system that we had 80 years ago, and as they observed it, and that, um, and that in order for us to actually get there, <clears throat> well, this is how they ended it. In this manner, the decline of democracy is set in elsewhere, and unless we take intelligent action, it may happen here. Uh, I just want to assure you all that, 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 that this is not Bernie Sanders' um, uh, program. Okay? It may sound like it. May, well, sometimes when we talk about monetary reform, we think, well, he's a socialist, and then this, this must be socialism. But this is the opposite to me. You know? It has nothing to do with socialism, at least by my reading of, of what socialism is about. But, um, but rather a very, 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 very narrow uh, definition of what's the proper role of government, and we have the historical context of that has always been the way that it was. Money, in order to make a prosperous economy, has to be in charge of, has to be in control of, uh, and in the charge of uh, uh, the government, as, uh, as however that is. So that's it. Um, I'm going I'm to leave it there, and hopefully I've, I've, I've got to generate a few questions. So thank you very much. Joe, that was terrific. Thank you very much. It's really great. My question is this. Under the idea of 100% reserve banking, that seems to mean that all of the deposits that the banks get from its customers have to be held and cannot be lended out. Now all the money that the bank has is virtually deposits with a little bit of equity. So does this mean that under 100% reserve banking, that the only thing that the banks can use for lending is that little bit that they have as equity? No. Okay. So, so one of the things about full reserve banking and fractional reserve banking um, uh, that always needs to be kept paramount, I think, and at the forefront is that there's no lending of the reserves, okay? And there's no lending of the deposits. There's a lend the lending that takes place is, is, is with, full reserve, with full reserve banking is the same lending that would happen with, 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 with real money. That is to say, they create credit. They create credit, but it's, but, but it's, uh, it's, it's fully backed. It's fully reserved. It's fully reserved credit. That's all it is. They don't lend out that money, John. That, that has never been true. And, and, and it will never be true. It, it will always be that, it will always be that, and that don't, don't, don't count for how we identify it as it moves through the economy, it's just the reality of it. So, so, so when, when, the banks, when the banks lend out, lend out money with fractional reserves, as they said, okay, and then they move to full reserves, as they said, there's no restriction on lending. There's no restriction on lending that takes place at that time at all. The banks can lend up to an, up to the equivalent of what they have for, for full reserves, up to the equivalent of that. They wouldn't lend out the reserves. They would only lend out. They would lend on the basis of the reserves. So, so there's no restriction. There's no. There's no. Yeah. There's no restriction. There's no reduction in terms of the money supply by going to full reserve bank. I, I, I hope I've, I've answered that, uh, and if I haven't, uh, you know, let me try it again. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, you know, as, as one of the things that we used to hear a lot, okay, is that well, if you go to full reserve banking, you can't lend. You know, you have to hold it. You have to hold, hold all that money in reserve. You can't lend, but it's not true. It's not. It, it was never true. It was. It was. It followed a flawed way of thinking about. About, about what happened. Because, because the fraction of reserves only relate to the demand deposits, right? All the rest of the deposits are fully reserved. Only the fraction of reserves is what they said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna take the demand deposits and we're gonna say, those only have to be fractional reserve. But by definition, sorry, by definition, uh, um, you know, savings accounts are fully reserved. So you have already 90% of the, or 80% of the money but did I say that wrong? Yes, yeah, savings no. and grants aren't reserved. Well, it, well it's, it's the checking accounts, the demand deposits that are fully reserved, and the 
time deposits would be great. Fractional reserve done with it. What my understanding was the 100% reserve proposal, it was the demand deposits that were 100% backed with reserves and the time deposits, I think in one of the proposals, it was like 5% um, holding of reserves against time deposits, isn't it? Okay, okay, uh, okay. So, so, so there were there were requirements for like 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 James said, ten percent reserves at the time for 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 the demand deposits, and there was also an additional reserve requirement on t on time deposits. I guess because you know something could happen with loans, but the fact is that time deposits are fully reserved. The money is there, you know. So 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 then they had to carry an extra five percent, but that had nothing to do with. That had nothing to do with um, limiting the amount of, of lending that, that could take place. In either case, in either case, whether whether they had fractional reserve lending or whether they had full reserve lending, the way that they were going to, the only way that they were going to lim, lim, limit lending was limit the money supply, in an attempt to, attempting to limit the money supply. So that became a, a matter of, as as they said, the lawless variability. So that so that with demand. Demand deposit, you could have excess reserves and lend out, you know, all kinds of money because you had excess reserves. Or then, when you come down to it, you had less than adequate reserves or, 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 or not required reserves. Put it that way, the lack of required reserves, and so and so they were constantly pulling in loans, okay, taking loans out of existence so that they could get back to their reserve requirement. That was the boom and bust. That's the boom and bust. That's the boom and bust scenario that they were talking about right there, and they were saying, "No, we need to make it stable. We need to make it. We need to make it so that the money supply is always more or less reflective of the production of uh, of, of capacity of the of the, of the economy." So, um, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to shortchange the discussion about it at all, John. Okay, but I'm just. What I'm saying is that. No, there's no relationship between holding uh, uh, money in reserve that you can't lend. That's not a. That's not real, and that's not true for your credit union. What's that? It's not true for your credit union. It's not true for a savings bank. It's not true for any of those things. It's 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 not how it works. It's not a correct depiction of how it works. Well, my understanding is closer to what. I understood Jamie to, to say here, and, and maybe it's saying the same thing you are with different words, I'm not sure. But what my understanding was, and somewhere where I read, freely from the Chicago plan or somewhere, is that the idea of time deposits were, were considered differently, and you referred to that. And time deposits are obviously things that banks can use for on lending. But nothing in that, in, in those, that 100% reserve of the of the uh, of the, uh, the other deposits that we would call our checking accounts, basically, my understanding was there was no lending against that money in any in any sense as a reserve or otherwise. That money was was sacrosanct, and it was only time deposits. Then, according to the Chicago plan, as I read it, that essentially banks could use for lending. Is that a different understanding from yours? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. It is. Yeah, we, need, we need to think more about it and do more reading. I will, I, 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 I will, I promise. Yeah. Uh, banks, banks can't lend uh, time reserve, of course, because uh, their liability of the bank, and the bank, it's impossible for the bank to lend its reserves. It's a liability. Right. It's a negative for the banks. So there's no, uh, I, I read 100% uh, banking by, uh, uh, reserve by uh, Fisher. Fisher, and uh, I'd like to go over some of my understanding with you and see if uh, you got the same picture because sure. this is very similar to that. Uh, it's not quite the same, but it's yeah. Fisher was in both yeah. camps there. Yeah. So um, if the banks want to lend. They have to have full reserve. But the way that they can get full reserve is out of their equity. 
uh, they can already have it, or uh, they can borrow it. They can go on the Fed funds market, or they can go to the discount window, and uh, they can, in that way, they can expand uh, the money supply because the the uh, they can expand the reserve simply by borrowing. So uh, the money supply is uh, more responsible than in the current system or in the 1933 system. It's more stable. And what they're trying to do is increase the stability. They're not tr trying to fix the money supply at a fixed uh, rate. Mm -hmm. and, and the money supply can still, could still be manipulated. Uh, there are all kinds of opportunities for doing things with it. But they just wanted to make it more stable. Uh, does that is that a picture that uh, jives with your uh, understanding? Um, okay. Good. Um, well, 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 let me let me let me try to try to say it this way. Um, what serves as reserves is determined by you know the regulatory authority. Okay. So so. Uh, to say that you know they could they could go out and borrow money and then use that for use that for reserves, um, usually what usually the definition of the capital of the bank is something that's outstanding on its own. Okay, in other words, in other words, it's not offset by by a liability that it has to somebody else in order to be capital. So so.